In earlier visions-based presentations, I've attempted to look at issues relating to the fundamentals of perceptual structure. The ideas are largely theoretical requiring evaluation, but derived from experiential encounter, and we've developed operational imaging software that deploys the basic principles. An understanding of vision emerges with the perceiver generating biological noise in order that incoming noise from the environment can be filtered by our perceptual system to reveal embedded spatial values. These build into a field structure, provisioning implicit spatial awareness. In this still life, I'll be looking at a number of issues, centering them around the importance of self-reference in imaging. You may need to fixate on the sculpted hands to accommodate its noisy feel. By self-reference, I mean the inclusion in the painting of myself, in the bodily sense as the observer stroke perceiver, or if you prefer, the inclusion of the artist intuitively engaged in manifesting the encounter. Self-reference is important, of course. The factors involved help us provide the elusive first-person, being there, aspect, so essential to both the saliency and subjective relevance of vision. We see or understand the world in relation to ourselves. Using the specialist data sets of vision space, references to the observer can actively contribute to the communication of presence. Where their inclusion in picture space or optically structured media looks rather incongruous. I'm also looking to further improve and develop methodologies for rendering the spatial texture of implicit spatial awareness within the painting discipline. I've adopted a new tactic and will be relating this to the work of Francis Bacon and building on techniques that have already been mentioned in other presentations. In the interest of those who have already digested this background, I'll try to keep the introduction as brief as possible. In vision space paintings, we establish a field of spatial values set out from fixation in X, Y and Z directions i.e. on a radial basis. Doing so sets up a field of values that emerge as a spatial texture within the image that I believe models our implicit spatial awareness, appreciable as peripheral vision. These spatial cues are not related to the familiar depth or occlusion cues of picture space or optical depth of field. They present a system of local values understood in relation to neighbouring values building into an holistic impression of spatial relations forming the three-dimensional scene. Set out from fixation, they establish proximity cues. It's not necessary to understand what the object or surface is appearing within peripheral field, or even the separation of distinct objects, just the spatial value occurring at that point in space. These spatial values, and hence this form of spatial awareness, is implicit, so not building out from post-perceptual or conceptually based consideration such as line, edge, object, plane, etc. Vision being closer to a controlled hallucination than the projection of optics. In setting out a system to reference this field structure in a painting, I was having difficulty to simultaneously render aspects of detail apparent within the spatial value. Some level of detail had to be sacrificed. This detail being entirely different to the crisp clarity of focus detail familiar within central vision. Computationally, the detail within a spatial value can be achieved with some ease by adopting a data structure known as disorder and applying this as an algorithm. But in painting terms, rendering this lies beyond the scope of the favoured toolset, namely brushes. In earlier paintings, I experimented by splitting an individual mark into four or five submarks forming a set that together supplied the spatial value. We readily understand the set value and also take in the detailed information supplied within it. However, this is both time consuming and frankly tedious to produce. It lacks the required fluidity and spontaneity, which are actually counterproductive in that it employs essentially an explicit process to render implicit awareness. The technique works to a degree, but looks laboured. A potential solution abandons the direct linkage between the spatial value of the individual brush mark and the required detail within the disorder. This doesn't incur in vision, of course. In employing this dual technique, it's necessary to weight the marks relating to the disorder detailed information to broadly reflect or acknowledge the spatial value associated with their location. The linkage between the two types of mark making would be reliant on the visual system of the observer to resolve and not the artist. And as long as we don't violate the system's principles and present too much of an anomaly, then the stimuli should resolve and present the required saliency. This range of marks simply used a series of improvised square edge combs. 
The results are OK if we don't look directly at them, but concentrate on the selected fixation point. At this stage I'd like to look closely at the portraiture of Francis Bacon, not least because this is where I first considered the use of the combs. The close-up from the triptych is a beautiful example of paint application, breathtaking even. There's a reason for this beauty, of course. It accords with the fundamentals of visual perception. The data structures that present within phenomenal field are not equivalent to those associated with optical projection. Consider the role that the texture of the canvas is playing. The paint is applied to the texture of the weave, with its texture playing a distinct role in the value and its subsequent evaluation. The texture provided by the weave is integral to the way the paint adheres and presents or fails to leave a trace. The result is something akin to noise. There isn't any evidence of an intentioned brushstroke with an associated direction and force indicating the involvement in the artist in its making. No lines have been articulated in the formation of the features such as the lips. Just amorphous areas, textured patches of paint, one against the other, or the bare canvas of the weave. The delineation of lines and features has been left to the perceiver to formulate from what has been supplied by the artist. In vision space painting, the weave of the canvas is replaced by the varying light blue marks underpinning the all possibilities field of perceptual structure, and into which the spatial values relating to the scene then register by reducing the all possibilities potential to distinct values. The paint applied to the surface of a bacon is manifested in terms of the canvas as a uniform 2D texture across the entire surface of the painting. Whereas in a vision space painting, a three-dimensional field of values emerges, based on the size of brush marks. The field structure of vision space affords an active spatial function, not just a quality of mark function, existing on a 2D plane. In the strategy adopted by Bacon utilising the weave of the canvas, the spatial aspect could not manifest. Is this the reason why Bacon doesn't really attend to the context of the scenes he depicts? Attention to the environmental background is minimalistic at best, and mostly just diagrammatic in nature. Sometimes it's blacked out altogether. His strategy can't effectively extend or extrapolate to approach the spatial context of the scene he's actually encountering. Its absence for me confirms not that Bacon didn't know about the issues, in fact quite the opposite. I would say he was acutely aware of the situation. The absence frames the question. How can this be manifested? What his strategy is able to do fantastically well is to get much closer to the nature of the disorder detail itself, as he doesn't have to trade this off against attempts to render the spatial aspect. He can then use the fine canvas weave, where I have to ignore it and find a system of brush marks that in themselves can develop the specialist spatial texture, and try as best I can to account for the disorder detail within the texture donating the spatial value. This is where my attention was drawn to the parallel lines or grating effect that Bacon often deploys across the canvas. It's as if it's applied by a comb in place of a brush. These marks are clearly adding value and form an integral part of the mark making process. They essentially introduce a new texture dimension and this improves the overall saliency of the work. The gratings are a device. This new texture is considerably coarser than the weave of the canvas, but doesn't appear to be used to indicate surface. They appear detached from the subject matter of the painting, but integral to the work somehow. Could this be Bacon trying to escape the 2D uniformity of the texture afforded by the canvas weave? Are these marks creating space? If so, it'd be an intuitive and probably unconscious development something that emerged as a requirement from the activity and engagement of painting, more than as a conscious decision. So I thought I would fashion this device to my own ends, and here we can see the application of graded gratings, from the garden, to the window frame that catches the light, to the arm of the angle poise, to the lamp head itself, and on into the plaster hands. Artists are forced to develop and adopt strategies that overcome the shortfalls inherent in their tool sets and materials, the trick is to know that when presented, the stimuli will evoke a perceptual response in line with a natural encounter with a real setting. With respect to self-reference, we encounter ourselves in bodily form within our presentations of vision. Our hands stretched out in front of us, 
our feet and legs as we bend over a table. But even if these are removed, we are still left with some key indicators. Our nose and eyebrows are ever present. The primary function of these protuberances into our field of vision is to position us in relation to the selected fixation point. The field structure that extends to include these features helps with our location in space. We can implicitly appreciate that we are embedded within our environment. We are enmeshed within our presentations of vision. The same cannot be maintained as we look at a photograph or current film-based media or VR simulation. Indeed, to avoid an odd-looking result, we are encouraged to compose views by removing extreme foreground objects before the optical media is generated. In this painting where my head is looking straight ahead but my eyes are off to the right and fixating on the girl's head, I have referenced the nose in either eye's field of view. As the eye is looking to the right, there is more nose profile appearing on the right side. These cues provide us with important orientation information. If this wasn't subconsciously apparent to us, we could potentially get mixed up between head and eye movements and assume an incorrect notion of our body's alignment with respect to the environment. The same fixation position with respect to head alignment is adopted here. Notice that as we are looking to the right, we become aware of my eyebrow and nose. Our conscious awareness of these body elements is intermittent. In areas of special interest, such as the sheep skull in the foreground, the occluding view is suppressed and disappears altogether. As one might expect, comprehension of all the marks that go to make up the facial features is best left to the computational processes at work in peripheral vision. So when looking at the designated fixation point on the hands, the marks relating to the nose and eyebrow become grouped. Also worth a mention is the rendition of the corner of the painting on the left hand side. Notice that it's considered as a 2D object and referenced as a 2D plane set at an angle with respect to the fixation, as is the floor. No attempt is made to replicate the spatially sensitive nature of the marks made while contemplating the real setting on the right hand side. In addition to all of this we must also consider the availability of binocular stereo information in relation to the associated mechanisms operational within phenomenal field. The fundamentals of how we achieve binocular stereo advantage within phenomenal field have been explored in previous presentations. Stereo information is modulated in central vision and also alternated within crescent-like shapes within the binocular stereo zone. If we then take this armature and align it with the selected fixation on the sculpted hands, we can appreciate the right-hand crescent is now lying over an area of phenomenal field that's outside the left eye's field of view. Consequently, there won't be any data from this eye to alternate with data from the right-hand eye. Only the left-hand crescent will be operational. If we are to bring a genuine sense of first-person awareness to imaging, then all of these factors attended to here should be considered and brought into play.